Well, hi, welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, we're gonna be sharing a workshop on raised bed gardening and the history of what we do at the Food Project with raised bed gardening and then how you can actually build your own raised bed garden. So I just wanna give a chance for all of our hosts today to introduce themselves. Um, we've got Chelsea, Naomi, Jaleen, and myself. And maybe while they are introducing themselves in the chat, everyone else in the workshop could go ahead and introduce themselves as well. You could share your name, your pronouns if you like, um, where you live, and maybe what made you love gardening or be interested in it in the first place. Um, I can go first. I'm Emmy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I live in Roslindale, Massachusetts. And I grew up gardening with my mom and my grandma. And I really love just having my hands in the dirt and getting to eat the food that I grow. Um, hi, I'm Naomi. I use she, her, hers. I live in Mattapan and I love gardening gardening because um, through gardening, I felt like I met some of my closest friends at TFP. Hi, my name is Jaylene. Um, I use she, her, hers. I live in Dorchester and um, I got into gardening because of my mom and my grandmother too. They just, it was always um, around me in my childhood. Right. Hi, uh, my name is Chelsea. I use she, her, her pronouns. And um, I got into gardening because of the food project. Um, and now it's a uh, love of mine, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. It's really cool to see everyone's answers rolling in in the chat. Um, definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, so just so everyone knows, I wanted to go over a quick agenda, which is introductions, which we're doing now. And then Naomi is going to lead us in talking about what our Build a Garden program is at the Food Project and the history of how that came about. And then Jaylene's going to talk about how you can build your own bed. And Chelsea will be leading us in an activity around planning your own garden, thinking about where to put your raised bed, and then what to plant and how to decide where to plant things in your garden. And then we'll leave a lot of time for questions at the end. Um, all of the folks leading this workshop have had a lot of experience building these beds and then also leading workshops around gardening in them. So I highly recommend you ask them questions about their experiences. Um, so just really quick before we start, I wanted to share a little bit about the Food Project, which is the nonprofit organization that we all work for. Um, and our mission is to create a thoughtful and productive community of youth and adults from diverse backgrounds who work together to build a sustainable food system. And our community produces healthy food for residents of the city and suburbs and provides youth leadership opportunities and inspires and supports others to create change in their own communities. Um, we have farms in Roxbury, Lincoln, Wenham, and Lynn, and we employ youth to run farmers markets and workshops, and we also build gardens. Part of our vision of a just and sustainable world is everyone having access to space to grow their food um, if they want to. And so that's a really central part of our programming. And Bloom Crew, which are the folks that we'll be presenting today, um, they are a new alumni crew that were formed in response to COVID. Um, they were formed to continue the important work of building gardens when our youth crews turned to more virtual work in, resp in response to COVID. Um, so they are really experts in this work and I'm excited to turn the mic over to them. Hi everyone, I'm Naomi again. Um, 
just to start off with the basics, what is Build a Garden? Um, Build a Garden is a program where our youth crews build raised beds for the residents of Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. And this is like the neighborhoods we primarily focus, but of course, sometimes we do build beds for residents outside of these three neighborhoods. Sometimes we might build a red, build a bed in um, Hyde Park or around those areas. And basically the crews that are in charge of Build a Garden is a dirt crew. And for those of you who are not familiar with the food project, we have um, three crews called dirt crew, um, seed crew, dirt crew, and root crew. And seed crew is our starting crew that we have in the summer. So we hire around 36 youth from all over um, the greater Boston region. And they learn about the basics of the food system and also learn how to farm and learn new farming skills on our farms out in Lincoln and in Dudley. And then after seed crew, a lot of the C crew members apply for their crew, which is our transitional crew during the academic year. So they're continuing their learning about the food system, but they're also applying it more to um, the Dudley neighborhood and working with more community members. So this is how they finally learn how to use the power tools to build these beds and like learn the whole process of like installing a bed. And then Root Crew is our more advanced crew, um, which is made up of youth who have been at the food project for more than a year. And they're in charge of building garden during the summers. Um, and they do it once a week um, each. Yeah, once a week throughout the six summers, I mean, six weeks during the summers. And when we do build a garden, we only charge a minimum of a $25 donation. And we do this because we want it to be really affordable so that everyone has um, access to have the option of having a raised bed installed in their own backyard to help with like the food system in the Dudley neighborhood. And recently because of COVID, um, the Build a Garden work has transitioned over to Bloom Crew, which is us who are alumni of the crew. So we're no longer in high school, we're all in college. And yeah, we've been um, in charge of Build a Garden during the fall and then Recently, we've been in charge of food distributions outside of our um, Dudley office. And we've been doing this since like around December, late November. And next Saturday is actually our last day for the food distribution. And we're finally gonna go back to installing beds for the spring and summer. So before I get to before I transition it off to how a bed is raised, um, we wanna tell you more about like the history of the Dudley neighborhood, which has recently been um, renamed to Nubian neighborhood and why this program got started. So like many neighborhoods in America, um, the Nubian neighborhood experienced a huge disinvestment in the 60s and 70s. 70s and this led to a lot of discriminate, discriminatory practices by the city, such as redlining. And for those of you who don't know about redlining, redlining is basically when the city maps out certain parts of the neighborhood of neighborhoods and they decide which neighborhoods get marked red to show that they are no longer um, being they're not worth the investment. And then other neighborhoods are marked green to show that they are worth um, the investment. So basically what happened to the Nubian neighborhood, they were marked red, um, which caused a lot of people, um, particularly um, landlords to burn down their houses um, to get insurance money. So this encouraged the white flight from the New, the Nubian neighborhood, which left a lot of residents of color to deal with the consequences of these discriminatory practices that was happening in the neighborhood. So after the redlining um, transitioned into the 80s, so a lot of vacant land was left behind because of the burning down of the buildings. And because there was so much vacant land, this led to a lot of people to see this as an opportunity to take advantage of these empty spaces and use it as illegal dumping grounds for a lot of like toxic waste and like um, eventually a illegal chop shop happened in the 
Nubian neighborhood where a lot of like car auto body parts were just dumped in the ground because a lot of um, places did not want to pay for the um, their waste to get dis like um, disposed properly. So because of a lot of these practices and like the exploit exploitation of the Nubian neighborhood, um, this led to um, a high lead contamination in the soil in the neighborhood. But after all of this, the neighbor, the residents finally said that enough is enough and they wanted to advocate for the land in the neighborhood because they began to take an interest in wanting to cultivate their lands and make them be community farms. So eventually the residents of the Nubian neighborhood formed a campaign called the Don't Dump On Us campaign. And this is basically when the residents advocated to the city and formed organizations that kind of promoted what the residents wanted um, for the use of their land and um, in order for it to be um, used properly for farming in the future and future residents of the neighborhood. Um, so through all those years of advocacy, this then led to um, the Delhi Girls priorities to be created. So um, after all of the advocacy that happened in the Nubian neighborhood, this led to the organization Delhi Street Neighborhood Initiative to be formed, which was um, primarily made up of all of only Dudley residents who helped bring voice to the neighborhood. And DSNI is a big reason why TFP is in the Dudley neighborhood now, um, which is our farm at West Cottage. So through recent years, TFP, um, DSNI, and the other group called ACE, which stands for Alternatives for Community Environment, went through a nine-month process, planning process that took between July um, 2014 and March um, 2015. And this was a collaborative effort between just regular residents of the neighborhood, um, all of these organizations, and they all had um, community members come to open meetings where they would um, just listen to what the residents wanted to happen in their neighborhood in terms of like what they wanted to do with food access and how they wanted it to see implemented in the neighborhood. So the Dudley, the basic like agenda of the Dudley Girls priorities um, helped create an outline slash goal for residents on how to create a self-sufficient food system in the neighborhood. And in the process, this would allow them to take back their land and take care of it for the community and future generations. And on the next slide it shows all the Dudley Gross priorities that were created. And I'll just read them out loud. The first one is build a resident owned supply chain for great food in the neighborhood and grow food businesses that create neighborhood wealth and jobs. Number two is permanently secure vacant land for growing by interested residents so that any people who wish to produce food for themselves or the neighborhood can do so. Number three is improve the food in our schools, ensuring that youth eating at school are well nourished with food they enjoy. Number four is expand access to great food for lower income residents, building creative new ways to make great food affordable to all. And the last one is encourage physical development to support and support the neighborhood food system, advocating for food interests and in planning, building and community development. So just to reiterate, the main reason Build a Garden was created was because of the high lead um, contamination in the soil. And so that was one way um, we were, TFP was able to have a hand in helping create a more, create a more self-sufficient um, food system in the Dudley neighborhood by allowing for people to grow um, affordable food right in their backyards. But this also led to a new vision of the Dudley Grows because residents um, saw that this can potentially lead to a future where it can expand to different things. Um, for example, a lot of the residents want a, a resident owned supply chain in the neighborhood so that they don't have to rely on corporate grocery stores like Stop and Shop in order to help keep the money in the neighborhood um, so that these processes and like these nonprofit organi organizations such as TFP and DSNI can continue working with the residents to help make these goals into a reality.
And the benefits of um, having a raised bed is that it provides protection from contaminated soil. There's more control over soil type and condition. You can garden sooner during the season um, transitions because the soil warms up faster. It's easy to attach trellis, fencing, et cetera, in around your bed to like um, help protect it from um, pests that wanna get into your bed. Um, it reduces soil compaction, so it's easier to um, transplant your seedlings. Um, you can maximize every inch of your bed with what you want to grow, so you can actually see how much room that you have in your bed to know what um, to um, actually plan out which seeds will grow um, well in your bed. You can water, water can drain easily from the soil and your bed can be used year round. And this is the flyer we created for Build a Garden. Hello, um, my name is Jaylene. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you guys about like how you build a raised garden. So now that you know the history of TFP, um, I'm like I said, I'm gonna explain how to build a raised bed, but first what is a raised bed? Um, a raised bed is a form of gardening in which soil is raved, raised above the surrounding area, often enclosed with a wooden structure, but can come in many different forms like brick, um, cinder, blo cinder blocks, galvanized, etc. The raised bed build a garden creates is a four by eight untreated spruce wood frame with landscape fabric and compost. Um, so before explaining um, all eight steps of the process, um, I just wanted to let you guys know if you have any questions on a specific step, um, you can write it in the chat and I'll try and try and get to it as I as I explain or just include like what step you have a question about and then we'll try and get it get to it at the end. Um, all right, so basically step one is gathering your materials. Um, we recommend wearing protective eyewear because when you're cutting the wood, it can get like, like the wood pieces can get in your eye and like other things like that. Um, um, the second material is three pieces of two by 10 by eight untreated spruce wood or any type of wood you want. Um, screws, we use four inch wood fasteners, um, a drill, circular saw, measuring tool, um, and landscape fabric. So some of the places where you can get wood um, are included on the bottom. So like New England Building Supply, Home Depot, Boston Building Resources, and Lumber and Home Improvement Center. Um, I am aware that like obviously not everyone might have power tools. So some of these places um, can actually cut wood for you. And then they're also, if you don't have any um, power tools, there are places where you can borrow or, or um, rent. Um, so, yeah. so step two is you're gonna grab a board, then you're gonna measure it. So since the boards are eight feet long, you're gonna measure it halfway, which is four feet and then mark it. Um, Step three is use a, tri a triangle tool or anything with a right angle to draw a straight line at the four foot mark. This will help um, when you're cutting the wood in half to get like a, um, a straight line. Step four is to take the bed you just measured and cut it in half. Um, as you can see in the pictures, we use a, a circular saw. Um, and then once done, set the newly cut pieces aside. Um, you can see all of that in the pictures below. Step five is lay out the boards in a rectangle um, or whatever shape you're doing. So the ends with the drilled holes match up with the ends without. So um, basically when you are setting up your, your raised, uh, like your bed, frame um, when you screw when you put the holes for um, the screwing the screws um, you you have to like match it up with the ends that don't have the holes in so it just makes it easier um, as you can see in the picture below it kind of like when it's set up it kind of looks like an L and a seven that's why we call it the L7 method. <laughs> 
So step six, um, you so after setting that up, you have to drill two holes in on each side of the board. So what we do is we measure um, half an inch from the end of the boards and two inches from the edges. Um, we mark it and then we drill the holes. So you can see that in the in the picture. I don't know if you guys can see uh, super clearly, but um, there are like holes. Um, I'm pointing it out right now. There are holes that we put um, like measured out. Um, it This is not a super necessary step, but it does help to not crack the wood um, when you're putting the screws in. So step seven is after laying out the wood, line up ends of, the ends of the wood and drill in the screws. Um, like I said before, we use four inch wood fasteners. Um, do this for every corner until all the boards are screwed together. Um, it's two, two screws per side. Um, and the, this is where like the L7 method comes in because when you, when you do that method, it just makes it easier for you to know what, like what boards line up with the other. Um, yeah. Um, step eight is after you're done, after you're done like building your frame, you can take your landscape fabric, which um, we, we measure out um, as eight feet or a little bit longer. So no compost or soil gets stuck in between. Um, then on the right, you can see all the compost in someone's backyard that we did during the fall. And in the middle, you can see all the crates of compost we use. We do about 24 crates of compost. I don't know exactly how much they weigh, but that's the amount that we do to get it filled up to the tip top. Um, if you have, if you have any more like questions about specific details, um, we do have a, a building a raised bed guide, um, in like on a shared, on a shared drive that you guys have access to. Um, we also have it on our website, um, that you guys can see, like if you, like you guys can download and stuff. All right. Hi, my name is Chelsea. Um, so I'll be going through um, now that you have your raised bed, where to put it and um, how to plant your garden. So the first step, um, like for once you get your raised bed, is determining which spot in your backyard to put it at. Um, and it should always be um, where the most sunlight, where the bed can get the most sunlight because that is um, how your plants are gonna grow the best. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the second step will be um, kind of piggybacking off the first one. You want to account for um, trees that may block like sunlight from getting to your bed. Um, and you want to make sure that the ground is even and that there's a source of water nearby just so, because um, usually in the summer it's really hot and you don't want to have to walk long distances each time to water your plants and vegetables. Um, and you always um, want to place your bed away from drip lines of buildings or structures um, so that lead paint doesn't get on them to avoid contamination. And the method that we use um, is squ the square foot gardening method for um, raised beds. So typically um, our beds are four by eight. So we arrange the um, plants in blocks and, eat, and each block um, will contain like a different vegetable or herb or flowers. Um, and the amount of seeds that or plants that you put in each square um, depends on how large the plant grows and how much space it needs to develop. Um, right. So some garden planting tips. So the first tip is to plant your crops. The, so the, well, before I get into that, um, I'll say that the best time to plant your garden will be in the winter. Um, and as you're planting, you want to 
try to um, kind of plant crops that are best suited to small spaces. Um, and you wanna use, um, consider planting your favorite vegetables in two or three squares. Most of the time people try to plant just any kind of vegetable, but um, typically if it's not something that you know that you're not gonna use, you probably don't want to um, plant a lot of it. Um, and then you should try to use succession planting on plants like carrots and radishes that mature quickly, just so once those are done, you have um, space to plant other crops that you'd like to um, use. And then um, you wanna reuse your squares once you're finished um, producing. So for example, after four weeks, you will harvest your radish and have empty squares. Um, you wanna plant another square of radishes in that space or perhaps like a fall crop of greens. Um, just so that you're always using whatever space that you have. And so for the steps as you're plant, planning out your garden, um, you want to first write down the plants you want in your bed. So the height of the plants, the size, um, how wide they grow, and the amount of space that they'll take up. Um, and you want to like on a on the bed sheet, yeah, on the bed sheet, um, mark where the north and south will be. So the north part of your bed is where you wanna plant the tallest plants, just so, cause the tallest plant, you don't wanna plant your tallest plants in the south because then those will block the shorter or smaller plants. So you always wanna plant the tallest plants in the um, far in the north and then your medium height plants in the middle and then your smallest plants in the south of your bed. Um, and I'll go through that with the little activity that we have for you. Um, and then you wanna start arranging plants based on height and what's most important to you. Um, and then fill out the date for when you can and will plant each crop in, in the estimated harvest time. Okay, so I see that there are some questions. Um, I've been answering most of the questions in the chat, but I do want to bring one to your attention. Um, do you all ever do raised raised beds, like higher heights for accessibility? And do you have any suggestions for folks who are interested in that? Um, in the past, we actually in the fall, we did one installation where this lady wanted a raised bed. Um, I think for raised beds, we usually go smaller than the normal four by eight beds just because they're easier to install. Um, but basically, um, we just stack them on top of each other. And then in order for them to like stay layered, we go in into the corners with like another wood piece and we drill it into the corner so that the bed doesn't shift. And then we just fill it up like a regular bed. One other thing to think about if you're trying to build a, a bed that's raised multiple levels is it takes a lot of compost. So something that we'll do sometimes is like put upside down buckets or something in the bottom just to reduce the amount of compost that you have to lug back and forth because the plants don't actually need like, you know, four feet of, of compost to grow in. Great. Um, another question that came up in the chat, which I answered, but I am also curious to hear your thoughts, uh, was about making sure that worms and beneficial insects can still access a garden, even if it's a raised bed and it's kind of lined with fabric and everything. Do you find that, that they do find their way in? Any suggestions? I think that they generally find their way in. A lot of beneficial insects come from the air instead of the ground, which is nice. So they can access the garden really easily. Um, and then there's usually some room like at the corners where, where uh, earthworms could come up in, but it still protects from any chemicals in the ground. And then also you can even buy worms or other beneficial insects and put them in your garden as well. 
Great, thank you. Um, somebody asked what alternative materials, what are some alternative materials that you can build? So besides wood, do you have any suggestions? Um, you can also use like cinder blocks or bricks um, to make like a bed frame and that works well too if you don't want to buy the wood um, because wood does rot um, so cinder blocks can be an alternative or just like bricks when you layer them up. I've even seen people use things like like old tires. It's like old tires you would see you get put in a dump or something normally. Um, you can make smaller beds that can even fit on a porch or something and they raise up well. Or buckets. There's a lot of different materials you can use. Basically anything you can fill with compost. Right. And I just want to say if you're using anything that's not food safe, you want to line it. Because some of those materials do, especially like tires, do leach. Or you can use it for deck, you know, ornamentals when it doesn't matter. Um, are there any other questions from the audience that I've missed before we go on? Oh yeah, um, I'm wondering if you ever do this. So somebody asked about preventing moles, voles, rats from burrowing into the raised bed and I mentioned lining with um, hardware cloth, but I wonder, do you find you have to do that? Um, I feel like we never like had that problem with like um, people, like for past people that we've done installations for, but I think one thing you can do is like find a natural remedy that kind of like um, prevents like squirrels or something from going into your bed. I think they don't like garlic, like the smell of garlic or something, or sometimes you can spray like a diluted like vinegar solution around your bed because that also like the scent of that also kind of like prevents other rodents from coming in. Um, how much time do we have left for the activity? Oh, oh, we can move on. Um, we have, we still have some time. We have until 325. We've got a little over half an hour. All right. Um, One important question before we go there. Uh, someone's wondering how they can get involved with your program. Let's say they want a raised bed, which I, I would be happy to put a link in the chat if there is one, or you can do that. One of you can do that, and then take it away. Go ahead to your activity. I don't want to hook you up. Was that um get involved with the? That was to get a raised bed. Oh, somebody put it in. There. Oh. Thanks, Emmy. Um, just how to sort of get a raised bed if they want. If you go to the website, there's a really brief application form on there, and we build for anyone in Roxbury, Dorchester, or Mattapan. Awesome, thank you. Um, definitely go ahead with your activity. We are ready. Um, okay, so for the activity, um, you'll just need like a sheet of paper, and we'll kind of use the front and the back for it. Um, so this will be just going through garden planning, um, just so, like what I was explaining, but through activity form. So what you're looking at, does everybody see like the seed information chart? Yeah. Um, so this chart is really helpful because it kind of details a bunch of different crops and um, how deep you can plant them and how to space them out. Um, and so you'll probably you'll need this for garden planning. Um, I'll also be using the growing guide that I think we have linked for you guys. Um, but on the first, kind of on your the front of your sheet of paper, you so this is like a planting planning chart. So part of one of it is um, what I want to grow, how like the spacing should be the height, if it's like a tall, medium, short plant, um, and the plant planting date, like when you plan to plant that, and then the estimated harvest time. Um, so maybe like we'll take one, two minutes. You can look at this. Um, just write down like what you want to plant. 
So kind of looking at the different crops or even if there's not a crop on there that you want to plant. Um, and kind of filling out these and then I'll go over um, how that would look like in a raised bed using the um, square foot gardening method. So let me just go back up. And let's say like five, like try to pick out like five crops that you'd like to plant and I'll, yeah. Okay, um, so I guess we can like write in the chat. I'm not sure. Let's see. Yeah, so you can write down in um in the chat what crops you wanted, or unmute yourself, um, and then we can go through how that would look like. So let's go down. Anyone have like a plant or a crop in mind to start us off? Spinach, okay. Also collards. Tomatoes. Yeah. Jalapenos. Bush beans. Okay, so let's start with the first one, spinach. So on here for spinach, it says that for the seed depth, you want to plant that halfway. Half an inch. Half an inch, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Um, and then any of them died. It's kind of short. So they tell you um, like what plants are tall. Um, they just finish with these small plants. And then these two, you decide like when you want to plant the spinach and then tells you how long it should take for the spinach. Oh. Very hardy. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so for the back of your paper, this is the raised bed grid. So because it's um we usually do four by eight, it kind of resembles that one. And for the north side, it would be back here. Not here. So, so that would be the north side. And if you remember, tall plants go north, and then the smaller plants go in the south. And for spinach, so you can plant about nine spinach per square foot. So in each of these little boxes, you could plant about nine spinach seeds. So we're gonna go all the way over here since it's a small one. Um, and I'll use this little thing to show the different We can make these bigger. Place. Place. And kind of with spacing. I want to make sure. They're well spaced out so that they can grow. Um, kind of looks a mess. But basically, nine of these per square um, for the spinach. And then you can decide whether you want to plant, like how many um, beds of them you want to plant. And not beds, but how many of the squares you want to plant. So if you wanted to do two of them, or if you want to plant like a different thing in this row or column, then you plant that. But for each square, it would be nine. Oh. Sorry about that. That was my brother. If you were hearing somebody else, <laughs> um, but yeah. So the next one that we have is collards. Not in there. So I don't think it's one of these, but in the film guide, it does. See, the collars are next to the kale under eggplant. Why are they? Yeah. Oh, cool. One. I think that might be. Okay. Oh, right next to kale. Okay. So I guess we could do. And then it's one fourth inch. So 
Let's see. So kill and medium height. So they'd be somewhere in the middle that you would plant them. And then you decide the date and you want to plant. And what is it? So estimated harvest time is about eight weeks. All right. So somewhere in the middle, let's do over here. And for kale, it's one um, plant per square. So unlike this one, where it was like you could have nine different seeds for the kale, it's just one because they grow really big and wide. So this. Can I just do and then you decide like how many once again, um, that you want to plant, but it would be one per square. And I think maybe we should do like a tall one to show um, what would go in the north, all the way in the back. And tomatoes are like one of those like plants that you have to trellis, kind of the same as bush beans. Um, so maybe we should do them. Mm. Right here. So for tomatoes, it says one half inch. They grow tall. Let's do the Yeah. And 17. Yeah, I probably want to plant tomatoes early on in the growing season because they take a long time. So for the tomatoes, they're actually um, quite different than the other plants. Um, it's part of the reason why, I mean, like, it, Jeff. So like for the other two, where it was inside of the square, tomatoes it would actually be in the center like it would be right over here that you would plant them um because they're way bigger um and take up a lot more space so it wouldn't be like dead in the center of the square it would be like right here in the middle um so let's see i'm not sure how i'll do this in google docs Yeah, like this little thing um, would be over here. So if you're planting like multiple, um, it'd be like one over here, another over here, and then another over here. Um, and you could plant like smaller plants around it. But if you're trying to plant like something like kale, I wouldn't advise doing that because that takes too much, like too much nutrients, like from the tomato plant. Um, it have to be something that doesn't take up much that doesn't need much nutrients to grow um, and you definitely want to make it like a smaller plant um, I don't know if anybody else like as we were doing it tried to make their own 
if you want to like share. But this is like a fuller picture of a raised bed. Let me take this out. Um, so like over here on the north end, there are peas, the archelus, and then the tomato. Once again, it wouldn't be over here, it'd be like right here, right here, and right here. And kind of all of these different plants are the same way, they function the same. So peppers, kale, eggplants, all of them, they you can only plant one of them in each square. Um, and then for bush beans, large onions, spinach, and arugula, they are about 12. You can plant about 12 of them in each block. And it's from tallest. So the tallest in the back, mediums in the middle, and then the shortest ones, like carrots, beets, radishes, and all those in the front, in the south side. Yep. So I'll do like a more clearer picture. <laughs> I don't know if we would want to do like going into spaces and trying to do one, but I feel like maybe this is a good time to open up for questions about. Um, I mean, we've we've talked about the history of the program and the importance of raised bed gardens, and then also how to actually build your own raised bed gardens um, and then planning your garden too. That was really cool, Chelsea. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has questions for our presenters about the information that they were presenting or their experiences um, building raised beds. Feel free to unmute yourself if you do have a question, everybody, or you can put it in the chat and I can read it out, whatever you're more comfortable with. I love this visual example, by the way. It's really cool to just see how much you can grow in one raised bed and just, you know, how you populated that and, and made a plan. I think the process of planning a garden can be really intimidating for people sometimes for the first time. So it's really nice that you walked through it. Um, and I want to highlight, there is one link that has everything in it. I also shared the growing guide link in the chat. If you just Google like food project growing guide, you find this PDF, it's incredibly useful. There's a lot of not great information about square foot gardening out there that has you put like a tomato in one square, just it has you crowd things. And, and your guide is actually the only one I've ever seen that has really good recommendations for spacing. So I'm always recommending it in our classes and I want everyone here to know about it too. It's really good. And lots of other useful information besides just that spacing stuff. Someone is wondering about maintenance. Can you talk about your experience with um, fertilizing and weeding in raised beds? Um, for fertilizing, I never like really had to do that. Um, so I can't really speak too much on that, but for weeding raised bed gardens, I feel like it's a lot more manageable than just like a plot in the ground because since it's contained within like a certain like square foot, it's easy to see like where the weeds are um, and just like really see like what, which um, plants in your bed need more tending than others. So I feel like it's a lot more manageable and a good starting point if you're like just starting with like your gardening experience. I think raised beds are great for weeding and making sure your plants grow really good. Um, just in terms of fertilizing, I would say the most important thing 
is adding compost every year. I feel like compost is just so amazing and will do wonders for your garden. Um, and you definitely want to replenish the nutrients every season, like early spring before you plant your uh, new seedlings. And then there's also a lot of resources where you can actually test your, um, your bed for the soil nutrients and send it to a lab. Um, and they can actually tell you exactly what nutrients you're lacking in your bed. Um, there's a link to the site where you can do that in our gardening guide. Um, so that's pretty cool. And they'll tell you what you actually need to add. And then you can go to the store and get um, the exact fertilizer that they recommend. So that's pretty nice. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, someone is wondering about spacing. If you have multiple beds, um, how much space did you put between them? And would you mulch or put cardboard in between? Um, for spacing, I would just recommend like um, for you to just have like enough room to walk in between the beds where you can like easily bend down um, between the two beds. And then for like, do you mulch or cardboard in rows? We just normally like when we um, install beds in like people's backyards, we kind of just leave like the grass in between the rows or we just use like like in our greenhouse, we have multiple beds and rows, like in our community bay, that's where we grow like our tomatoes for like the farmer's market. And we just have like a, like a tarp ground. Great. For, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying for like indoor situations, like a greenhouse. Um, somebody is wondering if they could get a copy of this grid, which would be really cool. Are you able to make a a link that we can just throw into the chat with for this actual document to share it. Um, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, Chelsea. Oh, this is a good question. How about protection from bunnies and squirrels hopping into the beds? Um, I know my sister dealt with like bunnies and stuff. She just put chicken wire around the around the bed. Um, I, and then like Naomi said earlier, there's, there's like things that you can spray on like, like diluted like spices or like, um, I know some, some pests don't like mint. So you can put mint in corners, um, just like things like that, that don't really mess with the food itself. Great. Um, how about watering methods that save water and meet the needs of plants? Do y'all know about the watering system we use on the farms? Oh, we use um, drip tape in the farms. Um, so it's just like, this big roll of like, it kind of looks like a hose, but it's like um, very like easy to use. And we just attach, so it has like two holes at the end and one end we attach a hose and like the other, and we poke holes throughout the drip tape throughout the, the bed. So that between every space of the plant, there's a hole that um, has water coming out of um, and at the other end, it's just left open for it to drain out. Um, so drip tape is like an affordable way to like have a good irrigation system. That's a great suggestion. I would also add if you, if drip tape doesn't work, if you just have one small bed, there are those soaker hoses or there's just the way that you do things. So like if you water in the morning and you make sure you use mulch so that the water isn't all evaporating quickly, those are two things that can really help you. And that's a great question. We definitely want to think about how to reduce the environmental impact of our, of our gardening. And with all the droughts we've been having, saving water is really important. Um, someone was asking, have you ever done the kind of raised beds, um, done the thing where you put like cinder blocks along the outside and plant in those? I know you mentioned cinder blocks or bricks. I don't know if you all have any experience using them. Um, build a garden doesn't actually use like cinder blocks in um 
bricks and stuff but like when we do deliver like the the beds that we build I have seen like some people with beds that have like brick or have like, have the um sorry <laughs> have the uh like tires and stuff yeah so great I know I haven't actually been able to find really good information about this I know there is um potentially some concern with cinder blocks and leaching into your garden so again you just want to like treat them as a non-food grade thing and line your bed if you're going to use them and then you should be fine um and lots and lots of people do it in their fact but just to be to be clear i just want to highlight thank you for that quick work chelsea um uh change the settings on the document so that you can get in there um well, this has been really great. Are there any final questions before um, before we wrap up or comments? Um, for like, just like a, an alternative, like use of a bed. I know some people have used like kiddie pools as like a form of a bed, um, just because kiddie pools are so cheap, um, like at Home Depot or something. And like people just poke holes at the bottom of the kiddie pools. At, like for draining so like that's another use of like a bed um also like if you don't have the space for a huge bed you can also like look into container gardening and basically just like using um like containers like buckets or like um what are those called like um those like barrel things that people used to have wine in, like those pe people use those too. Um, container gardening is definitely like a, a good solution if you don't have any space because um, it can be as big or as small as you want. Um, yeah. I feel like that's a great segue into just a little shameless plug of mine, which is that we have some workshops coming up this spring. And one of those is a is a virtual container gardening workshop. So if you look at the trustees.org slash seeds, so you'll find all of those. Most of them are free uh, and at least have a virtual option. I'm going to put a couple of other links so that you can review the conference um, just when you're done with, you know, if you're going to look at workshops the next couple of days, you can wait. Um, and also a couple of other things like a sign up for our email list and stuff like that. If there is anything, um, if you want to do anything like that for the food project, if you have other programs coming up that you want to let folks know about or anything, feel very free presenters to put that in the chat. Um, we so appreciate you. This was really great. Thank you. And um, hopefully you'll have a great season and hopefully a little bit less of a restricted season. Um, thanks again. I'm going to